Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Kim, and I'm really excited to present my scholars project on the scaling laws for language transfer learning. Um, so throughout the OpenAI scholars program, I was really interested in questions around data, um, what characteristics and attributes are there, um, and how does that impact model performance? So for my project, I looked at how do the scaling laws look for pre-trained English language models as we transfer to other languages. So historically, the advancement of deep learning capabilities has been centered around three different levers. So that's better algorithms, faster and cheaper compute, and larger high quality data sets. Given machine learning's potential significant impact in society, deepening our general understanding of machine learning and how certain factors improve models is critical for making better predictions of which capabilities are going to develop next and when. Further, the exploration of scaling laws um, evidence across these three factors has created a way to measure the impact of these three as they interact and limit each other. So my project's framework is inspired by the work on scaling laws, which was published by OpenAI in the past year. Um, scaling laws predict machine learning performance, as I said, as a function of model size, data set size, and the amount of compute used for training. So you can think of compute data set size and model size as different limiting factors um, that you can be uh, changing to get better performance. And recently, scaling relationships were found for transfer learning from pre-trained English text models to Python. So scaling laws for transfer are important because the scaling relationships can help explain how to work in a limited data regime. So in an ideal world, you're going to have an infinite amount of data for your models to be learning from. Um, and by that, I mean that you're only limited by the other two factors, compute and model size. But getting a large quantity of high quality data is a non-trivial task, and it's oftentimes uh, near impossible. As a result, most problems that we want to study are actually in this low data regime. Uh, before the scholars program, I was a machine learning engineer, and I saw firsthand how costly it is in both time and money to get good quality data. Um, evaluating these trade-offs is a uh, pretty important and practical question uh, that many researchers and practitioners have to handle. So building upon the work from scaling laws for transfer, my experiments try to answer the question, how much does pre-training actually help when we're transferring across different languages, um, being Chinese, Spanish, and German? And what does that look like as we vary the data set size and model size? So for my experiments, I first had to pre-train English language models, um, and I pre-trained decoder-only transformers of size 124 million non-embedding parameters to the, my smallest model size, which was 3.3 million non-embedding parameters. Um, I trained this all on Open Web Text 2, which is an open source version of Web Text, which was used to train um, GPT-2. I used the same hyperparameters from the original scaling laws for neural languages paper, except I used a 500 step warmup with a cosine decay to 10% of the max learning rate here. Um, the text was encoded with the same GPT-2 tokenizer, um, which is a byte level byte pair encoding with a vocab size of 50,000. And all the models were trained to about 26 billion tokens. And as you can see here, um, my models exhibit scaling laws similar to what was found in the scaling laws for neural languages, except this line isn't quite linear here, um, and that kind of indicates that maybe my largest models are undertrained a bit here. After getting my pre-trained models, um, I next set up my fine-tuning experiments. So for fi my fine-tuning experiments, I wanted to focus on changing the number of tokens in the data while holding performance, which in our case was cross-entry loss and model size constant. So for these experiments, the data set size spanned six orders of magnitude, while the model sizes spanned two orders of magnitude. And I trained this on three different languages, which were Chinese, Spanish, and German. So for the Chinese data set, I used this data set called Community QA, which um, is similar to the web text corpus. And then for German and Spanish, I got it from OSCAR, which is a multilingual corpus um, got by classifying the common crawl corpus. So in my experiments, the thing that I really wanted to measure was the effective data transferred. So what does that look like when we are training from English text to Chinese, Spanish, and German text? And so the effective data transfer um, can be measured as this is the amount of fine tuning data needed to get to this loss when we're um, using a pre-trained model. And then this purple dotted line is the amount of additional data that we would need to get to that same loss when we're training from scratch on um, this data set size. So it's important to note here that, as you can see, the amount of data transferred from pre-training gets smaller as we increase the number of tokens in the data set size that we're looking at. 
Um, and eventually for this model, it converges around uh, 10 million tokens for the data set size. So I wanted to show you what it looks like when we actually compare these three languages. So this is like the exciting bit here. And so you can see that for the pre-trained English models, they help the most when we're learning um, German versus Spanish and Chinese. And that kind of makes sense because I think these results reflect a lot about the linguistic similarities between English and these other languages. So English and German are both derived from Proto-Germanic and are linguistically most similar. And although Spanish um, shares many of the same symbols as the English alphabet, it's actually in a different family of languages. And then obviously Chinese has a very, very different alphabet than the English alphabet um, and is very distinct there. Um, another thing I wanna highlight here is a bit about the shape of the lines and the distance between them. So as you can see, the effective data transfer for Spanish and Chinese is not too different at this initial point here um, for a data set size of 8,000 tokens. However, as we increase the data set size, we can see that pre-training continues to help for another order of magnitude um, compared uh, to Chinese here. Another way to think about um, the, the amount of data how much data is actually useful from pre-training is to think about the um, fraction of effective data of fine tuning. So the smaller this fraction is, it means more pre-training, uh, means pre-training has helped us more. So as you can see in these graphs here, as the model size increases, um, this fraction decreases all languages, which means that pre-training has become more effective. Um, but as we increase the data set size, um, this fraction increases across model sizes, and that means pre-training has become less effective here. Um, a lot of these results here on this graph show um, the same points that I brought up on the previous slide about how far apart are maybe these distributions are from each other. Um, and as you can see that the German graph here has steeper curves compared to the Spanish and Chinese, and I think that indicates um, that there's more transfer uh, happening for German compared to the other two languages. Another interesting thing that we found was that pre-training helps most in low data regimes. So in a low data regime, pre-training is most helpful across the data size, uh, across model sizes, but especially in the smaller model sizes. And you can see here, as I increase the model size with the fixed data set size um, of Chinese text to find uh, to fine tune on, models trained from scratch on Chinese did not improve while the models were, the models pre-trained on English continued to achieve um, better performance. So you can see here that these flat lines here are where we're data limited um, in the setup um, versus when we start to see an increase um, in the slope, uh, we're now parameter limited. Another important thing to note is that pre-training and using pre-trained models is way more compute efficient than uh, using uh, training from scratch. And you can see this here um, for this one model size uh, for this one data set size. I want to talk about some limitations that some of my experiments had. And so the first one is that I use the same tokenizer for all languages. So this is an issue because as I mentioned before, the tokenizer had a 50k vocab size and Chinese um, has over 50,000 characters in its uh, uh, language. So that means a lot of the tokenization is probably quite inefficient. Um, and so this could impact model performance quite a bit. So I think for future work, uh, you'd want to train your own tokenizers um, and then transfer to learn from there. Another point is that uh, it looks like from my original uh, plots for the pre-training that maybe I could have been pre-training for longer. Um, and then I think I could have gotten a more linear line for some of the scaling laws that I saw for the open web text models. Another thing um, that I would wanna do is do a more thorough hyperparameter sweep and learning rate sweep, um, as I believe that both of these uh, limitations uh, would cause a very, very different results. Um, and I believe the numbers that I've gotten in the previous slides would be very different um, had I found the ideal optimum learning rates for the different data set sizes and model sizes. Um, one other note is that my data, the, the languages that I got are from different sources. And so I think this, experiment could be more thorough if I had used the same um, data set source for all three of the languages. I want to talk about some future work that I'm really excited about after this project. So I think one thing that could be really interesting is to compare the effective data transfer as we use pre-trained models of a different language back to English. Um, 
then you can maybe create some kind of mapping of how far apart are distributions from each other? Is there some kind of symmetry in the data transfer there? Um, and what does that actually look like? Um, another obvious next steps would be uh, to actually use the setup to do uh, work in low resource languages or other tasks and distributions that are quite different from English. Um, another thing that would be very cool to do based on this work would be to predict the ideal ratio for pre-trained versus fine-tuned for any given problem for some compute, uh, for some budget that you would have. Um, another thing that I think would be interesting in the same format of experimentation would be studying the forgetting problem in transfer learning and see what that effective data transfer looks like as we um, are approaching this problem. Before I answer questions, I wanted to give some thanks to folks. Um, I want to thank JT for sharing his wisdom with me throughout the program and keeping our project on track um, and for staying up late now from Poland to hear this. Uh, my fellow scholars, especially Danielle and Cujo for sharing compute with me. Um, and everyone that gave me feedback throughout the process and program, um, especially Danny and Mo, and a shout out to OpenAI for making all of this possible. Great, so now I'll answer some questions that I have here. Uh, I have a question that says, uh, which model architecture was used to transfer learning across models? Um, and also which one was trained from scratch. So the model architecture that I used is the same like GPT, GPT uh, transformer. So which is a decoder only uh, transformer. Um, let's see. Um, I have a question that says, how would you extrapolate what kinds of gains from pre-training you'd get from models smaller or larger than you've been training or from smaller and larger data sets? Um, so I think you would just be able to conceive the similar trends um, that we saw in my previous slides uh, for the different uh, data set sizes. And I think as, you, as I saw, the main takeaway is that if you have a large uh, pre-training data, uh, fine-tuning data set, um, it may, uh, you're not going to get as many gains as you would get from a much smaller fine tuning data set. Um, another question is, how is my setup related to the scaling loss for transfer paper by Danny Hernandez from earlier this year? Um, so a lot of my work is super inspired by uh, Danny's experiments there. Uh, so I did the same type of uh, experimentation where I was changing the data set size as I was varying the model sizes um, and as I was comparing for uh, the loss between those. Um, I had a question, this last question, it says, uh, did you consider transfer between other types of languages, say programming languages? Um, and I would actually say that you should check out the uh, scaling loss for transfer paper because that actually does look into how does English transfer to Python. Um, Um, so I got another question that says, uh, did you get a chance to study performance on metrics other than loss? Um, and I didn't, but I'd be kind of curious to see how you could characterize this on uh, downstream tasks. And I think that's like a pretty big thing to uh, look at for transfer learning in particular. Uh, there was a question that says, would you like to use a different tokenizer in the future? And uh, yeah, definitely. I think being using a train tokenizer on the specific languages would get you much better results um, and therefore probably much cleaner uh, graphs. Um, and then I had a question that says, was there any reason you decided not to train models smaller than 2 million parameters? Um, not particularly, I uh, just thought much, much smaller models than that would result in uh, losses that weren't maybe that interesting to look at since we'd be parameter limited um, very quickly. 
Awesome. So I think that's all my time. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Danielle, who's going to be presenting her project.